I am Ivana Damjanovic and with my colleague Nicola de Sadeler we will delve into the links between trade and sustainable development and provide different perspectives on the European Union's trade and sustainability agenda. We have a pleasure to speak to Mr. Philippe Pochet, who is the General Director of the European Trade Union Institute and also an academic. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome too. Yes, we have the chance to interview you in the Museum of European History. Uh, European history has been shaped by the labor movement and we just discussed that sustainability is about reconciling labor standards, environmental standards with economic growth. What's your views about sustainable development? I think the, the definition is uh, rather easy because uh, that's the definition that you, you gave. There is uh, three three pillars, three corners in the triangle and all should go hand in hand and, and function smoothly. Uh, that's the theory, and, uh, but the pra practice is completely different. That, uh, as you said first, it's about economic growth uh, and that's the most important and so far uh, in the trade agreement, but in general, economy is more important than social and environmental question. So, uh, it's, in theory, it's the, the same level and the, the same weight. In reality, it's a little bit more complex. If you go internationally, I think for the, the trade union movement, it's rather, at, at least the European, the story is a little bit different for the American labor mo movement, but it, it, it's rather easy that kind of the, 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 the important is the ILO convention, and that's the, the key question, and then you can uh, add some else and safety, a little bit of wage, but not so much as very different from the American. But for the environment, it's rather complex because that, if you take that seriously, and there is a, for the moment a, a big conference in the European Parliament about post-growth, uh, what is the link between environmental question and growth? Uh, and that's very open. And what is the link between environment and social? Uh, there is clearly two groups of actors, different actors. People are interested by social, know generally very little about environment, and people are working on, in the environmental field know very little about social. So it's also it's not a kind of uh, smooth community where people are knowing all the different parts of the story. It's more a question of tension, it's a question of conflict, it's a question to put rightly uh, the, the, the narrative uh, about the future. So it's important because there is kind of consensus about sustainable development. But it's also a fake consensus because you, when you, you, you go beyond uh, of the term, you see that everyone has a different definition and weigh differently the different part or, or the three part or, of the system. Interestingly the enough, um, the doctrine and uh, the case law stresses with respect to sustainable development, uh, the need for reconciling these different interests. And, and you have been stressing conflictual issues. Is labor so conflictual? It's not labor, but uh, that, that's really uh, wh wh when you see that the, the story, the, the standard story is that you need to have growth, and then with growth, you will have social uh, benefit of, of growth. So, people speaking uh, about uh, growth say, okay, why to speak about social except very minimal? Because growth will create the condition to have better. better uh, social condition, but we know from the history, and you said uh, 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 at the beginning we are here in a museum, uh, and museum, we have to remember the, the history, no, we uh, the give for free right to the worker, is the, the, the fight uh, of the workers, is a strike, is, is that uh, the trying to influence the political agenda, so it's not a story uh, that uh, you put all, uh, and uh, uh, it happens very often uh, at European level, you, you say development is sustainable, that you solve the, 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 the question, the trade is fair, and then you seem to, to solve the question. It's not because you say the, the, the growth will be green, that you solve the question, that there is tension. And, and we have to, to recognize the tension. It doesn't mean that you don't have to work for a consensus and to try to find compromise. That, that's the labor movement. It's about strike, but also dealing and have collective bargaining and stri uh, uh, having agreement with the, the employers. But you have the both sides and you don't have to analyze with just one side.
the EU legal order is reckoning upon a number of internal market measures, also labor dire uh, protection uh, directive. Uh, on the other hand, the EU concludes a number of uh, investment agreements as well as trade agreements, associations, cooperation agreements with third states. What's the best approach to um, uh, foster the uh, EU global influence? And from a labour rights point of view, um, are unilateral measures better placed than a bilateral approach uh, in order to protect labour's rights? When you see what is the goal of the European integration, it's convergence, it's a social market economy. So why this part is not in the trade agreement? That part should be also in the trade agreement. It's logic because what we, we did is a trade agreement, basically the, the, the first uh, uh, treaty. So I think that the, 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 the question should not be why, but why not? Uh, and, and that's the reason. Uh, then you have to, to see how you can manage that, and, and you can manage that. The best will be uh, multilateral, and, and for a long time that's the Europe was pushing to continue the multilateral agreement, and, and then the uh, US uh, was pushing to have bilateral agreement, and I, I remember I was in Canada discussing with colleagues about trade, and Canada was hesitating, asking me what is best, the European approach or the American approach, and then uh, the European approach uh, just go for bilateral agreement because it, it was a principle of reality. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 I think DNA of Europe is multilateral, uh, multilateral agreement. They do bilateral agreement because it is no longer possible to have a kind of uh, uh, international order uh, which is functioning uh, smoothly and certainly uh, no longer since Trump was <laughs> president of, of, of United States. So that's going to be. So that's the, 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 the point. And, and I, I think that then you have to negotiate what is possible and, and what you want to achieve. I, I think. And, and then you, the main domain that we are thinking is that we are in competition. Uh, and you compete and there is one winner. But if you take no a kind of different perspective, that we are, we are in the same boat with the climate uh, crisis. So what we have to do is cooperation. It doesn't make sense that we have a FIT uh, 55 in Europe if there is uh, no solution for Africa. The challenge for me is how we tackle globally the climate uh, uh, crisis. And with the climate crisis, what we know, uh, and then you, you link differently your sustainable development triangle, is you cannot do that if you don't have a kind of clear social support, because people will protest. Uh, people want to develop, want to have a kind of new prosperity. So you, you re-articulate the, the question of growth, the question of environmental question and social in a different setting, no longer about thinking how we can compete and who will win, but how we can cooperate that we have the same goal. And I think it, it, we are far from this approach, that's very clear. But if you see all the sign and, and all the, the movement, that, that's, that's the future. And that, I think what the trade agreement for the future will have to take in consideration, which will be completely different approach, uh, basically, uh, from the beginning about what trade could bring. You mentioned trade agreements and the EU's trade agreements have dedicated trade and sustainable development chapters. These chapters include provisions on participation of civil society in the implementation of these agreements through different forums, for example domestic advisory groups and civil society forum. What would you say about the effectiveness of discussions in these forums? Can you explain how these forums work and what were some of the outcomes of these discussions. Yeah, that, that's the other part, of, I, I, I think, of the count, that 
We had the, the big story, the conflict, but you have also at the trade, you know, they are very pragmatic. There is an opportunity, you take the opportunity and you try to do the maximum with what you have. And as we know, it's a weak opportunity, but it's a real opportunity. So in the different uh, working group, there is normally five uh, people from the trade unions. As you know, the working group, there is representative of civil society, business uh, and trade unions. And they take that uh, seriously and they, they, they try to make progress. And I, I give an example, which is uh, really important. It's uh, someone uh, who was a uh, special advisor uh, at the ETUC, so the, the Trade Union Confederation, who is in charge and now the president sharing the uh, agreement with Korea for, for the part, uh, sustainability, environment, and, and social. So they, they push uh, Korea to agree about three of the four main ILO convention, which was not the case when Korea entered in the, in the, into the OECD. So it's a big achievement because that, that's give a new dynamic within the country. With that, you don't solve all the problem because if you can solve the problem of, uh, uh, of uh, the social by adopting uh, international convention, it will be too easy. But at least you give some kind of possibility for the trade unions, for collective bargaining, to develop and then to, to rebalance. And from all the, the, the studies that we, ha we have, when you have collective bargaining, when you have trade unions, you have fairer uh, distribution of wage, you have less inequality, and you have better wage. So indirectly, that could create, I don't say that will create, but could create some internal dynamics. So that's a, a huge success. It's not enormous, you can repeat, uh, I, I, there is other evidence that, for example, the, the, the trade union from the Netherlands, uh, the CNV, try to support some of the, the trade union in Peru, uh, and there is some uh, possibility. But what is important here is also that uh, the trade union are working rather well with the NGO. Mm -hmm. And they regret time to time that there is uh, no so many NGO from the environmental side because uh, that's not so uh, so frequent. Uh, and they also work very well with all the trade unions, the counterpart of, of the trade unions, with one exception, which is Vietnam, who, as you know, is uh, <laughs> the trade union <laughs> belong to the government. But that's also important because you can define an agenda from both sides. If not, you say that's the interest of the worker in Europe. You, you see the, what is their interest in, or the worker in other countries, that's in the bilateral agreement, and you find a compromise or you can improve the situation, but not impose the situation. I think that's really also what is the logic of the European Union and the trade unions. It's not that you arrive to give lessons, it's you arrive to try to create dynamic and you're creating a kind of dynamic uh, setting, then you, you improve the situation in the, uh, in the country. And I think that's really different to say, we know what is good for you. And that's very different. In order to strengthen trade and sustainable development chapters, in 2022, the EU has introduced a new approach with a number of novelties, including the possibility of trade sanctions. Do you see that these novelties are going to be even more effective? And do you think that trade sanctions are going to be used in this context? I think that trade sanction is really a, a difficult question because that's when you are arrive to sanction, uh, then you are, you are, you, there is no longer trust. And in, in a way, you, you try to create trust and you try to create a kind of common uh, understanding of the situation. And when you arrive to sanction, you are in a different uh, dynamic. But in the same time, uh, we are in a world which is starting to put limit. And once again, uh, uh, 
uh, it will be with the environmental. The CBAM is a, a way you can say is indirectly some sanction. It's the sanction that they don't take measure in their country. Then you are, you 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 have you will have uh, the kind of. Uh, uh, trade uh, levy uh, on, on that. So, so that's the, the, the question of, of sanction is rather difficult, but I think it's also more difficult because now when you see we are, we are arrived, we seem to uh, arrive to a kind of plateau of the globalization. Mm -hmm. So if you look to, for the good, we arrived that there is a slight increase, mm -hmm. uh, but not so much, uh, not the same with the service. So could be also that we are arrived to more regional uh, agreement uh, and that then sanction could be uh, used because if you, you go the, the, the precedent world, I think sanction is difficult. But if you have more regional, when they, they, you see the competition with US uh, and China for, for the standard, for, for, the, for the, the defining the, the market, uh, etc. Uh, and Europe trying to be in between, uh, that's something different. If you take strategic autonomy, that we, we, we should reinvest in Europe. If you t take IRI in the uh, US and, and you, you take the, the 25 uh, strategic plan in China, you, you see that the, the three regions try to reconcentrate on themselves, which then the the possibility or the risk of sanction will increase because then you have to justify why you are no longer in an open world but you have a more closed world even it will still be very open. Recently the European Commission adopted the communication of the European uh, Green Deal. One of the key landmark measures uh, of this Green Deal is the due diligence uh, directive that places a number of obligations upon major corporations uh, to look after the value chains, uh, to, uh, so to speak. Um, in your view, is the implementation of that directive likely to raise the labor standards in third countries, in particular in developing countries? I think uh, as the, it was the case for, for the weak provision on social and environmental, it's an opportunity. <clears throat> in this opportunity, and then you need to have a narrative and you uh, need to have a balance of power. Uh, and that's changing also because the reporting uh, starts to be a, a little bit more serious because, okay, you can have what you want uh, in law, but if you don't report and each company is reporting differently, you cannot compare. So that, that's really important. And it's happened, I think, with, with the uh, general pressure of the market here, I don't speak about the trade union, but about the taxonomy, about the, 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 the enterprise uh, be uh, rate uh, according to mainly the, the uh, environmental standard, but also some social standards. So in all the environment uh, of the enterprise, it's not just that you have due diligence, it's that you have the reporting on the, the, the social and the environmental, you have pressure even from the central bank, uh, to, to, to reconsider partly uh, the, the value chain uh, and you have all the strategic autonomy which is even more important from the COVID to, to the Ukraine. So there is there something very different, uh, at least potentially, than before when the logic of the uh, uh, enterprise is okay, I put the value chain when I, I, I'm doing the maximum benefit and mostly was in China. Now it's changing also because China is not so cheap. It's no longer the cheap country. That's kind of, uh, there is uh, the minimum wage in China is higher than in Bulgaria, in the, the coastal state. So it's, it's, uh, we think it's uh, cheap, it's not cheap. And, and then you have a kind of reconfiguration. And the question is no all serious it will be. Uh, or serious, the, the, the company will take uh, that uh, in consideration. But it's a kind of uh, different instrument, legal instrument, I, I mean, or sometimes soft or quasi soft instrument, but hard and soft instrument at European level. But what is changed, the, the, I think, the, the 
enterprises, partly or the NGO and trade unions can work on the supply chain, but it's also or the investor will invest in, in the company and will say, okay, I invest in this company because they take care about the environment, that we have more and more uh, SDG uh, goal, uh, integrate, but uh, I take also care about social and, and you have the, the, the index and then uh, that, that's the stock market make the difference because people can say, okay, if I do that seriously, perhaps I, I, I will, uh, my share will go or up or I can borrow a, a lower price because my reputation will be good. So I think that's kind of general context which is uh, changing, not just the due diligence that is, uh, that's, uh, take a little bit more space in the, the, the European debate. So we talked about trade and sustainable development chapters in trade agreements. You also raised a number of questions about unilateral measures of the EU. And generally we could say that the EU's agenda is much more ambitious compared to some other countries and parts of the world. But what the EU could do more, realistically, what it could do more in order to enhance global labor standards? I think that's the, the, the point is the, uh, still in the EU, when they, they have a trade agreement, they, 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 they think first trade and then you, are, you, you had what about social, what about environment? It's not integrating what we, we start the discussion about sustainable development, is you take one, what is the trade and what will be the, the gain uh, in, in the trade. And then you have a little bit social and a little bit environment. That's, uh, I think, if you don't take in kind of big perspective and you say, is business uh, as usual, you go nowhere. I think that you have to reverse perhaps the, 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 the view and say, what is important? No, what will be the ecological consequence of this uh, agreement? What will be the social or can we improve the investment and, uh, and, and continue to be open. And I think what, uh, to finish with, with that, what is the, the, the advantage of the, the European approach is much more than the US gets some kind of collaborative approach to, to try to find uh, agreement, to, to, to uh, have some, uh, uh, some support, to have some, some uh, provision that are, are not just about trade and I think if you can keep this kind of uh, open approach uh, that, that's the most important. Philippe Pochet, thank you very much indeed for providing your insights into the Nexus trade and sustainability. Thank you. Mm -hmm.